With NBC making the unprecedented move to create a second pilot for Star Trek, Roddenberry immediately began the daunting task of putting the whole thing together once again. But with this second pilot, there would be strings attached, and no one knew if they would be a good thing for the show or a bad thing. Hello and welcome to Backtrack, a web series that focuses on the background information of any given topic in Star Trek. In this, the second part of our look into Star Trek's history, we'll focus on the creation of the second pilot and all the problems that surrounded it. I hope you enjoy. NBC was taking no chances this time, promising to keep an even closer eye on this pilot's production than they had on the original one. Also, they had a few stipulations to which Roddenberry had to agree to or the new pilot simply would never be made. First on their list was character changes. Proven, at least in their minds, right about Majel Barrett not being able to carry a series as a lead position, they demanded she get the chop. Roddenberry was also not happy about this and began to argue for keeping her when the network execs also insisted that the Spock character be axed as well. Gene had a huge love for the character he had created and felt it was a necessary component to the show. We, as an audience, he felt, could reevaluate humanity through the eyes of this Falcon. And so, briefly giving it some thought, weighing his options, he deduced that he could probably save one of the characters in a compromise, but not both. So he chose to keep the character of Spock and ax his mistress, and he was successful in that compromise. Actually, NBC hated almost all the characters in the first pilot. That is, except for the captain. Well, at least they had a leading man. Of course, though, that was not meant to be either. Jeffrey Hunter was approached to reprise his role as Captain Christopher Pike in the second pilot. And a few days later, his wife showed up at the studio. Taking her into the screening room, she viewed the original pilot and then afterwards said, My Jeffrey is a movie star, not a television actor, and walked out. Jean did not like Hunter's wife one bit. She was a very demanding woman. In fact, many times during the production of The Cage, she would barge into Jean's office and make demands like, Jeffrey can't be filmed from this angle anymore. Or he has to eat this type of food today. With that, Jean Roddenberry decided not even to pursue Hunter, as he felt that Hunter's wife would end up driving him mad. And so, Star Trek was back to almost square one, at least when it came to actors. Another stipulation NBC had was that the filming budget would not be allowed to go over $300,000. And the filming of this episode was to take place primarily on sets already built for the first pilot, as they would not be giving more money for any new elaborate sets to be constructed. And, once again, Roddenberry was to submit three scripts to NBC, who would decide which would become the second pilot. So with these restrictions in place, Gene set to work on reinventing his Star Trek baby. First, with such a small window before the network expected filming to begin, there wasn't enough time for Gene to write all three scripts, something which he wasn't happy about. So, Herb Solo enlisted the aid of writers Steve Kandel and Sam Peoples. Gene would go on to write his story, which he called the Omega Glory, while Kandel would write a story he called Mud's Women. At first, excited about his involvement in Star Trek, Kandel's view quickly soured when Roddenberry added his name as story creator to the script, something Kandel never forgot or forgave. The final script written by Peoples, which he called Where No Man Has Gone Before, was an exciting tale which showcased all the best elements and staples that Star Trek would become known for, while simultaneously showing the great potential the series actually had. And as we all know, when the cards were laid on the table, the Peoples script was the one that was chosen to become the new pilot. The other scripts, however, would be reworked and both would end up as episodes in the series. Roddenberry then proceeded to flesh out all the new characters aboard the ship. 
one of the first to be hired on was to be that of Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott. James Goldstone, the director of the second pilot, having James Doohan in mind for the role, loving Doohan's uncanny ability with dialects. I did several different accents for Gene, and uh, he picked the Scottish because the Scots make the best engineers. Originally, the chief helmsman was to be another actor with the name Sulu being reserved for the communications officer, who was to be a male person of color. Of course, this would all change, as to everyone, Sulu sounded more Japanese, and Sulu also sounded way too close to Zulu for anyone's liking. George Takei would actually be hired on to play the Enterprise's biophysicist. He wouldn't become the helmsman until the series was actually picked up by the network. Of course, Sulu's changing career would spark many a debate in canon circles. Gary Lockwood would come aboard the ship as the navigator and main villain for the episode. Sally Kellerman would play the ship's psychologist opposite Lockwood. Paul Fix would play Dr. Mark Piper. And finally, William Shatner would beam on board as series lead. Captain James R. Kirk, later of course to be changed to James T. Kirk as it rolled off the tongue much easier. Shatner wasn't the first choice for the captain of the Enterprise though. Gene actually approached Jack Lord to be the esteemed captain, but Lord turned down the role after Gene refused to give in to his demand for 50% ownership of the show. Second on Gene's list was William Shatner. And once he auditioned for the role, Roddenberry immediately snatched him up as Shatner represented everything he saw in his imagination for Captain Kirk. With all the actors in place, it was time to find a cameraman to film the pilot. Unfortunately though, none were available. This was not good news for Gene, Desilu, or NBC. In order to keep the production on track, they had to find a cameraman stat. Justman, discussing the issue with director James Goldstone, was informed that an old guy that Goldstone knew might be interested in filming this pilot. Desperate, Justman agreed and set up an interview between Roddenberry, Solo, himself, and this old-timer. Ernest Haller, a gray-haired old man, showed up to the meeting, and all three men thought Goldstone had either went nuts or were playing a prank on them. After the usual pleasantries, Solo turned to Ernest and said, Uh, Ernie, can you tell us what you've worked on recently? What you've done? Well, not much, Ernie replied after a long pause. I've kind of been semi-retired. The three men suddenly looked very worried. Solo piped up again. Well, Ernie, have you done anything, you know, that we might have heard of? Another long pause. Well, yes, Ernest replied. I did do a film you might have heard about back in 1939. Disgruntled looks were exchanged between the three men once again. Then, Ernest Howler suddenly volunteered. It was a film called Gone with the Wind. Two minutes later, Howler was hired on to film the second pilot. So on Monday, July 19th, 1965, filming began on Where No Man Has Gone Before and immediately ran into problems. You see, Desilu was an older studio with very few productions being filmed in any of its studios. And in fact, some had laid abandoned so long, like that of Star Trek's, various animals and insects had made their home in the old studio building rafters. Well, as filming went on, a low buzzing noise steadily getting louder could be heard. It seemed a colony of wasps had taken refuge in those rafters, and the extreme heat given off by the stage lights had begun to agitate them. Then, all of a sudden, the entire swarm descended on the stage, stinging everything in sight, including William Shatner, who got a particularly nasty sting under his eye. Well, exterminators were called in almost immediately, but filming was stopped due to Shatner's eye puffing up like a baseball. The next day, when Shatner returned for filming, his eye was still swollen. 
As a result, in some of the filmed scenes, you can see the legacy left behind by these buzzing little troublemakers. During the battle scene between Lockwood and Shatner at the end of the episode, Lockwood had to roll around and land near Kellerman's feet. Well, the scene was going perfect. Shatner punched, Lockwood rolled, and in fact ended up exactly where he was supposed to. Unfortunately, because his pants were quite tight, when he landed in front of the actress, his pants decided to give way and completely split. To add insult to injury, it quickly became apparent that Lockwood wasn't wearing any undergarments. So here Lockwood was, lying at Kellerman's feet, phaser drawn as it were, and without missing a beat, Lockwood looks up at Kellerman and says, Smile, you just had your picture taken. To which Kellerman, also not missing a beat, replied, What? With that little brownie? Everyone broke out in laughter. That is, of course, except for Lockwood, who turned a shade of red that would make any dying security officer aboard the Enterprise proud. Another interesting problem for Star Trek was that the script for the second pilot called for Lockwood and Kellerman to have silver eyes. Where today you could simply CGI anything you wanted into a person's eyeballs, back in the 1960s everything had to be done physically. This meant Lockwood and Kellerman needed special contacts. John Roberts was hired on to make the silver monstrosities, and although he was very dubious as to the results, when Justman showed up to his lab, he had already made a working pair for him. In order to make the eyes appear silver, he had to use tin foil and laminate it onto a regular contact lens. Justman was impressed, but immediately noticed a problem. They were solid silver. So Justman asked, how are the actors going to see through them? See through them, Roberts replied. You never said they had to see through them. So to solve the problem, Roberts made a hole in the center of the tin foil, and away Justman went with the eyes. Well, when the silver eye scenes began filming, it was quickly apparent that these eyes had a few problems. One was that they were very irritating to the actors to wear. In fact, Lockwood and Kellerman had to remove the contacts many times during filming just to give their eyes a rest. The second problem was that, though the actor could now see through the contact lenses, their field of vision was quite limited. As a result, in order to see who they were talking to, they had to tilt their head at peculiar angles, sort of looking down at their fellow castmates. This, of course, in the end, worked to the show's advantage, as it gave an alien, godlike condescension to the characters themselves. The charisma between Kirk and Spock was immediately apparent to those watching the filming. There was something so much more charming between those two than in the Cage's Pike and Spock interaction. Shatner and Nimoy really brought those characters to life, and Gene's decision to axe Hunter as Pike suddenly became completely justified. The second pilot was shot in only nine days, Bob Justman recalling the reason being that Desilu was so cheap and didn't want to pay for more time. Considering the studio's financial troubles it was experiencing, this isn't hard to believe. Though filming was complete on the pilot, there would be a significant amount of downtime before the show actually got pasted together into the finished product. This was because Roddenberry was also working on two other pilots for two other shows at Desilu. Of course, neither of these shows were picked up, and by American Thanksgiving, Gene was back to full-time on Star Trek, furiously editing the episode together. And by the beginning of 1966, the pilot was complete, and once again airmailed to NBC in New York, who this time absolutely loved almost everything about the pilot. It was an action-adventure tale so easy to get into, a true wagon train to the stars. Within weeks, NBC had given Star Trek the go-ahead and placed it on its fall schedule. With that deadline in place, Roddenberry, Solo, and Justman began the enormous task of bringing a weekly television series like Star Trek to life. And again, there would be problems. 
Thank you for watching today's episode of Backtrack. What did you think of the second pilot? How are you liking the new series of historical Star Trek information? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. It takes a lot of research and patience to make a video like this. And so, if you'd like to help out the channel, then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching. Live long and prosper.